uh, chemicals, toxic waste, pollution, um, and, and basically the, which, which involves everything from the uh, uh, uncontrolled uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the toxic wastes that are placed into the into the ground uh, up to the uh, ozone, uh, you know, the breaking of the ozone levels and all that. So that what what we're what, what we're experiencing here is uh, rapidly accelerating atmospheric imbalances. Uh, one simple. Uh, I think most everybody is aware at this point of the situation with the deforestation of the Amazon, which uh, the uh, source of oxygen on this planet basically is in the tropical forests. Uh, and as the tropical forests uh, are uh, being uh, uh, chopped down, burned down, and so on, uh, we're affecting the oxygen balance of the planet. And what's taking place is carbon dioxide. Okay? Um, one example of this uh, that had the uh, effects that most people are not at all aware of. It's important to have this information. Okay? We were at a conference recently. And People say, well, don't we start we start giving out some of this information? People say, don't do that. You know, they, they, they look at it as fear tactics. Okay, uh, this isn't. This is just information because it's information that is not passed through the established government um, news channels. Okay, when the Aswan Dam was built in Egypt, uh, it had a very interesting little side effect. The side effect was that the the silt that had formerly run down the Nile was no longer running down the Nile. That silt was rich in nutrients that uh, uh, fed all the algae that gathered at the delta. And the algae then spread out to the Mediterranean. It was this algae that uh, were, was responsible for uh, consuming the carbon dioxide that came down from industrial Europe. Now, when the silt with the nutrients stopped coming down to the delta, the algae in the Mediterranean died. When the algae in the Mediterranean died, the carbon dioxide cloud from industrial Europe moved south. When it moved south, it moved over the Sahara, where there's no biomass at all. What happened as it moved over the Sahara is that, it's, that it started stirring up very strong winds that, that started creating unprecedented dust storms in the Sahara. These dust storms then start spreading out over tropical Africa uh, and create, have created, uh, uh, at this point, a semi-permanent uh, particulate cloud, which uh, when we were lucky enough to see uh, photos of this that were taken by NASA satellites, which NASA, of course, has not released. Um, but when you, when, when you looked at these NASA photographs and looked at, at uh, uh, pictures of tropical Africa 15 years ago and, and very recently, um, the uh, effect was rather startling because tropical Africa looked like a, 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 a thousand Los Angeles is on the worst day. You couldn't see, uh, you could not see the jungle. Well, what the effect of that, of course, we know is that there's famine in, in Ethiopia. We know that the Sahara Desert is moving 30 to 100 kilometers a year. Lake Chad, 15 years ago, Lake Chad, which is the size of Lake Erie, was a flourishing lake today. It's dry. This thing is moving very fast. And on top of it, uh, when, when what happens with this with this um, dust cloud is that uh, the uh, normal uh, uh, chimney effect of the, of the uh, cumulus clouds rising up from the jungle, that because of the dust cloud, those clouds no longer rise. As a result of that, there's rain. There's no rain. So the jungle, uh, the, the desert is moving very quickly. There's drought. There's Famine. And on top of it, uh, the same thing is happening in many parts of the uh, jungles of Africa as is happening happening in the Amazon. We, we were shown one uh, NASA satellite photo of 
portion of northern Angola, 10,000 miles of northern Angola, burning out of control for deforestation purposes. And the worst part of that is that um, because it's jungle soil, that uh, once, once the trees are cleared, there's no topsoil there, so when people use it for agricultural purposes, it lasts only a couple of years and they have to go someplace else because there's no topsoil, so it's a total waste. The result of it is that, that, the, that, that both in Africa and in South America, where the oxygen uh, uh, for the planet, uh, the main generation for the oxygen the planet, these places are being destroyed very rapidly. And uh, most people talk about what's called a greenhouse mm -hmm. effect, but in actuality what's happening is uh, that the ice caps at the, at the Arctic and the Antarctic have been increasing in size. The greenhouse effect is just a very temporary effect, just an uh, interval period uh, before another uh, ice age is triggered. In other words, we're, we're on the verge of, of, of very prematurely triggering an ice age by the atmospheric imbalance that we're creating. Now, if you go back, you say, well, what's how, if you're going out there and saying, hey, I'm Dr. Space and there's a sick planet, <laughs> and you say, what, what is making that planet sick? <laughs> what is making that planet sick? And then you say, well, what's making that planet sick is that there's, all, there's this one particular species on there that uh, it has for a very brief period of time, less than 100 years, become very addicted to automobiles, to, to chemicals, to automobiles, and that way of life. Jets just come only in the more recent years. Automobiles have been with us less than 100 years. Because we are, we are at a point where it's, it's very clear that the that what we have to be looking at, and what we have to be envisioning, is a way of life that is uh, not dependent on fossil fuels and chemicals. Right. And that's that's really if you want to get down to the to to, to creative visualization. This is where you should be putting the energy of the creative visualization. And how how is that done? The whole of the uh, American and Soviet uh, military uh, uh, industry is, is completely geared to is, is completely not geared is completely anchored in in the fossil fuel and chemical exploration. Also, what is known are are the alternative energies. But because the investment that has been made by the large corporations, Global Shell and, and, and Exxon and all of the corporations, because of the investment they have made in maintaining their profit on, on these things, along with the alliances that all the companies have with the military, the um, implementation of alternative technologies has been uh, kept way back. Okay, it's, it's, it's top top secret because uh, this this type of thing, as we know, Nikola Tesla uh, was way ahead of his time in, in the 1930s, up to the time when he died in 1943, in understanding what's called free energy. Nothing more terrifying to uh, General Electric than free energy. Well, everybody. Okay, wait, 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 just, you know, hold on, everybody. Just, <laughs> wait a minute, okay. I'm not, I'm not particularly here to give a neo Marxist spiel, okay? Uh, but this is just uh, this thing, and what it really comes down to is we really want to look really at what the hard facts are. These are really the hard facts, okay? And this is really, if you want to get into creative visualization, this is where, really where, where you start. What, and also the other, the other 
just one last part, and then I'm going to switch gears, okay? As we know that the, the, uh, uh, all of the so-called uh, debate discussion on, on arms, okay, that happens between, particularly between the two major superpowers, that not one uh, ounce of energy or shred of energy is spent envisioning the implications of disarmament. And all of this has been a, a figure out if we go down this far, can you go down that far, if we go down that far, what we do there? But if you really go all the way down to the bottom, there's not not one ounce of energy to spend. What really is what really are the implications of this arm? Because again, the military, the the, the, the arms race is completely anchored in the petrochemical situation. Okay, so no one ran, and also just the nuclear energy, okay, nuclear energy and the petrochemical, those are just the, the most, they're like, they're like, what, those, those are to the, to the um, planetary arteries and circulatory system, what, what alcoholism is to, you know, and alcohol in the blood is to, to uh, human beings, nothing, nothing more polluting as far as what we can put into our system. Than that. And this, that's basically the kind of trip that, that we're on right now. Okay, well that's that's just to get to the to the hard facts, okay? And that, that's really, uh, so if you want the bottom line for creative visualization, can you visualize yourself um, uh, taking a car apart? We were recently with, with um, Rupert Sheldrake, who came up with the more dramatic field and so we're talking about this and what what uh, uh, his he and some of the people that he's working with, what they're doing is they're proposing that groups adopt an army base. These groups adopt an army bases, these groups adopt a bomb and start I mean that sounds funny a little bit, but uh, you start you gotta start visualizing it. You know, it's not just it's not gonna just go away because we sit around in our little groups and look at crystals and yeah, good as that is. And that, that's how Rupert got to that place when his groups realized they were all doing these light visualizations and then they suddenly realized, wait a minute, this light, is this the light of Armageddon? I mean, is this the light of the new ultimate nuclear explosion of everything going up? And that's when they got more pragmatic and said, Wait a minute, maybe we really do need to bring this back down to a level of actually dismantling. Uh, so, so that's so that's 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 getting at it, okay? That uh, uh, you know, we have to start neutralizing. The first thing I have to do is start neutralizing that energy. Start, you know, like you know, we don't have to go march around our bases, but we can actually project our energy toward neutralizing uh, this situation, knowing we're all in place, knowing where strategic command places are near you, and, and begin to focus on neutralizing. Better. Anyway, that's that's basically um, the kind of script that we have to be looking at. Okay, we have to be looking at can can we start to create a good house? Can you? Or one of the one of the ways that's come to us is can can you creatively visualize uh, a post militarized post fossil fuel job description? Okay. Mm -hmm. Or put it this way, if you start thinking about it, there has to be uh, an integral thing. Can you imagine the kind of world you want? Okay? The creative creative visualization of the future. Okay, and, and Earth ascending, the fifth stage of Earth ascending. We're in the stage right now, nature evaluates man's transformation. The fifth stage is man and nature synthesize. Okay, to get to that stage where I mean, that's what, what we're talking about there is that that's the that's where we really get the evolutionary shift. We're, we're not allowed to do our evolutionary shift until we've cleaned up our act. So we have an interval period of time that we're looking at where um, we have to turn around what we've done. We have to clean up the mess. We have to learn 
that it's possible to live without a lot of the things that we've become accustomed to living with, and we've got to learn that, that in order to really get to the next stage, we have to clean this up. So we're talking about the potential of the, well, first of all, of a great cooperative venture. And, you know, we, we saw, and, and we go back in history books, particularly to World War II, and you know, we saw how the the, um, uh, the allies mobilized all of their energy. Okay, the, uh, you know, we look at that. There's a lot of interesting motives there. Uh, there was a great depression. Uh, so whatever the case, there was a there was a, a mobilization of energies that we have not experienced since then. You know, so coming together to look at what happened in, in the United States and Canada and, and Britain and all the allied countries where people were able to rally and to mobilize to do something. They, they got all their factories going again and they created bombs and they created war. They supposedly saved the world. So we're, we're, living with, we're living with the after effects of that. So, but we did see that there was the potential for mobilizing energy. And this is where we want to start drawing work. What are we going to do? We want to start drawing our consciousness together. We want to start drawing our highest will, our highest intentions, our highest integrity. This is where we have to start drawing it. This is, it, it has to come, it has to come from us. This type of, of envision, it's kind of creative envision that that, uh, it, it, that in order to to at this point we're in, we're in a position, uh, who knows? Maybe maybe uh, uh, we could have a nuclear war, and maybe we could you know, continue polluting, and and maybe in 15 years there wouldn't be any more human beings, and maybe in another. 200,000 years, the Earth would be a garden again. Who knows? Okay. So obviously, we're not particularly interested in that option. Okay. That's, the, that's the option that we face every day that we do not make a commitment to creatively envision an alternative. Every day, that we, every moment that we do not creatively envision an alternative, that's what we're creating. We're contributing to that creation, that either we become uh, a gigantic petrochemical sludge pool asphyxiating ourselves like uh, gerbils. <laughs> I thought I had some gerbils once and she refused to clean their cage and asphyxiated themselves in their own waste. Mm -hmm. anyway, so we're, we're in that, that kind of situation. We can, we can either asphyxiate ourselves in our own ways because we refuse to look at the consequences of our actions or we can blow ourselves out nuclear. Those are, those are where, where we're going. And one way or the other, within the next 15 years, you can bet your bottom dollar we're going to get there. So, um, or we can begin to creatively live and creatively envision the alternative right now. And that means beginning to look at, think about, imagine taking over We are the power. And it's not, you know, it's not going down and taking over Ottawa or Washington, D.C. It's taking over our own communities. Because that's where we are. And uh, if, if we're going to, to um, get past addiction to fossil fuel, and the West where we're going to remain. And we can do what we have, but we have incredible resources. And the most incredible resource we have at this point is, is our knowledge and uh, a communication situation that uh, will, that already uh, has virtually allowed every human being on this planet to be in touch with every other human being on this planet. You don't have to travel. Not not physical. You can travel. So, so the, the, what's usually referred to as the information age, okay, and the technology of the information age is already here. And as a matter of our getting smart, 
can begin to cooperate and understand this and use it and hook up. That's going to be the way this thing is done. We start making those kinds of commitments. That, that getting together with our, our local, our communities, and learning about uh, the most, uh, as Boydine has mentioned, the very, very extensive communication centers that are now available. We begin to start to, to utilize those and, and start to create, you know, a local bases with, uh, with, with this type of understanding of technology. That's, that's the very, very first uh, step in creating this matrix of the future. Well, you've got an interesting point in all this is that, again, if we take this too seriously if, as if it's our individual responsibility to go out and do something, you know, you start to get that feeling of knocking your head against something. So I think part of this the envisioning of these resonating core groups is to actually know that we can't do this alone. I mean, that's why part of this traveling around we've been doing is just simply saying, you know, that we do need each other. I mean, we, we can't possibly go through this process without being in touch with each other. And there's one slogan that we got that I think is very, very helpful in terms of understanding that nobody is directing this, you know, that this is a leaderless kind of operation. And that is in the phrase that um, the need for confirmation is the last obstacle to self-empowerment. The need for confirmation is the obstacle, last, last obstacle to self-empowerment. Back. It's, like, it's like, don't wait, you know, don't wait to be told what to do. It's more like, again, bringing this thing back to trusting our own intelligence and trusting our, our instincts on such a personal level. It's like what we actually do day to day and how we actually meet with each other. And it, it does require some creativity to let go of the old patterning and to really look, even that thing of like not taking your children to McDonald's and telling them why and beginning to talk to our children more. And if any of you are involved in the school system, it's actually letting the teachers there know as well what's going on in the Amazon. I mean, it's like the way we network is becoming information gatherers and information disseminators. And there's, there's tremendous power in getting the information through. So whatever connections we have to the media, it's you know, beginning to use whatever our connections are to make the shift.